أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته peace and blessings be upon you dear viewers from all around the world wherever you may be watching this is Ahlul Bayt TV the only channel broadcasting the pristine teachings of the Ahlul Bayt عليهم السلام exclusively in the language of English I'm your presenter for this evening Abdurrahim Shukoya and this is Reborn the show that dedicates its time to hearing and airing the stories, the extraordinary stories of brothers and sisters who have made the step, the enormous step to Islam and of course to the Madhab of Ahlul Bayt, peace and blessings be upon them all. And today we are very lucky to have with us Sister Latifa Shalabi who will share her story uh, about how she came to the Madhab of Ahlul Bayt, peace and blessings be upon them all. So make sure you stay tuned because it's very fascinating, as always, of course. <clears throat> First of all, sister, thank you very much. And I know you've had a bit of an arduous journey coming to the studio. Uh, but on behalf of all of our viewers, welcome. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Okay, so sister Latifa, can you give us a bit of a background in terms of your ethnic origins and so on and so forth? Um, well, uh, I'm originally Palestinian and um, I'm sure most of your viewers understand the conflict that went on in Palestine and had um, led many uh, original citizens to escape and um, try and seek refuge in other countries. Uh, my family had uh, seeking refuge in Lebanon and um, from there uh, my father who was a doctor had um, married and went to Libya, to where I was born. Um, and uh, from there I had uh, spent five years of my life uh, in the hot country among all the wildlife. Um, not really, I don't remember much except some goats and some trees. Mm -hmm. um, other than that, uh, I do remember the years after which uh, we had moved to Lebanon for two years, uh, in which there is a strict um, Arabic slash Islamic uh, course taught to the children. So my education was quite um, heavily dealing with uh, Arabic and Islamic studies. Okay. Uh, so Quran, I remember reading Quran, I remember reciting it, I remember you know the Islamic dress code, I remember uh, the Adhan being played to, um, five times a day or recited rather five times a day. So there is a bit of a Islamic um, culture that sure. I remember as a child. As a child, okay. So these these memories are still, still there. What was um, obviously you said you you can you're very young, so it's understandable you could you couldn't really remember much about Libya. What about Lebanon? I mean, how long were you there for? Um, I lived there for two years with my family. So from the age of five to seven. Yes, from the age of Do five. Do you remember to seven. much about the life in Libya? Uh, uh, sorry, in Lebanon. I remember. <coughs> I do remember a lot about that life. It was um, very community-based, which is really nice in comparison to you know sometimes you compare it to the West. It was very um, very community-based. There was uh, a lot of freedom for children. Again, in comparison to the West, there sure. isn't. So, you know, kids would be running around in the street, having a lot of fun, you know, playing around, being mischievous, but at the same time, having parents be 100% secure and comfortable with the fact that their children are safe. You know, there's no one out there to hurt them. Uh, what else do I, I remember my mother and, uh, you know, like cooking and my father going out to work and coming home, you know, traditional family setup. Um, I remember my grandparents, and I, I do remember the conditions actually of uh, living in a refugee camp in Lebanon, quite harsh, uh, very very primitive in you know in comparison to here. The roads and the hygiene, the uh, the insects and the infestations that you get there. Mm. Um, plus, certain people lived in such poverty, you know, that you that, that would make you cry. A family of four would be living in literally two rooms, mixed, you know, male and female, and that's not right. Sure. So, including a bathroom and a kitchen in those two rooms, you there's really no no place to do anything and live comfortably. I, I do remember it. Mm. And presumably this was because um, they were Palestinians living in Lebanon. Yes, yes. Palestinians in Lebanon, unfortunately, uh, have a very, very grave fate of uh, being second-class citizens. 
um, individuals who are Palestinians are not granted the rights of work. You know, you're not allowed to work as a lawyer or as a banker or as a doctor. Uh, you're not allowed a place in government. Um, you you simply either have to work, um, as people say here, like on the black market, working, you know, without being legally registered, or you have to create businesses within the refugee camps mm. and expand that way. Mm. Um, I know cousins of mine still back home who have dentistry, um, uh, dent dentistry, dentistry practices as well as uh, grocery stores and things like that opened up within the camps. The camps, which they are prospering, but at the same time, you think that's that's very horrible for just for something that you can't control. You know, sure. to to be a Palestinian, it's not <coughs> in your hands. God has given you that identity for you to be prosecuted for something that you you have no control over. Sure. So, I mean, how, how did it work for your dad? Because I think you said he was a doctor. He was a doctor. My father, um, he had uh, been educated abroad. Um, so there were certain provisions. I think the United Nations at the time were pretty active in that aspect. And they, uh, they had um, provided a lot of opportunities for Palestinians who, wanted, who could study abroad. So my father went to study in Russia. And he, did, again, he opened up a practice inside the refugee camp. Okay. But that wasn't very fruitful, which is why he um, left for Lebanon. Uh, mm. Libya. <laughs> he left for Libya and um, worked there. And when he returned, uh, we he returned with the intention of uh, moving to Europe. Okay, and and hence the reason why you spent the best part of your years in the UK. Yes. You came to the UK at the age of seven. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I'm curious to know what. I mean, you mentioned how it was for you in terms of going to Arabic school and reciting and learning the Quran. What was religion like for you at home? Uh, religion didn't pl play, have much of a, a part in my life uh, at home because I think, unfortunately, as women, especially in the East, you have such burdens put on your shoulders. As um, you know, you're supposed to be the perfect housewife, you're supposed to make sure your kids are clean, uh, you know, smelling nice all the time, you know, that your house is supposed to be completely uh, spotless. spotless and at the same time you have to maintain yourself, you have to keep yourself presentable, slim uh, and finding time to watch TV or, you know, entertain yourself as an individual, I think that, that was uh, a lot of pressure on any mother or any woman. Uh, in coming from that kind of background or having those cult that culture placed upon you. So from my mother's side, I don't really blame her. But um, And my father, obviously, coming from a traditional family situation, my father was out at work all day, he'd come home late, and um, us kids were kind of left to our own devices. You know, we'd either play if we want to, we'd go to our neighbor's house if we wanted to. Um, so in, in the home, I wouldn't say there was much religion. I understood that there is a God. I understood what Allah meant. I understood that there is a prophet called Muhammad. And I understood that when someone prays, they wear certain garments, they you know, do certain actions. Um, but I, I didn't understand the spiritual aspect of things. Sure. Um, what about uh, in the UK? I mean, was there any sort of uh, Islamic influence? I mean, were you sent to uh, is Islamic school, Saturday school, like in a religious Saturday school, anything like this? Yeah, when I did come to the <coughs> UK, alhamdulillah, my mum uh, did uh, want us to be educated and make sure that we didn't lose the language. Um, it's, it's so important, you know, learning the Quran and of course. Um, also the fact that it's uh, part of my heritage, which I'm sure she didn't want me to lose either. So she did uh, make sure that we were part of a school and that we would go there every Saturday. But again, um, it wasn't, for me personally, it wasn't much of an Islamic um, influence. It was, uh, it was just another place to socialize with children mm. and you know, try to read a few sentences in Arabic and not look like a fool in front of the other kids for not uh, learning it the week before. So uh, although the intentions that my mother had were great, I, I don't think that it had much of an impact for me Islamically. Right, okay. Um, I'm just curious as to how it would be for somebody. I mean, m maybe you weren't necessarily thinking that much about religion then, but coming to the UK at the age of seven, you know, into, you you know, round about from seven to your teens, I mean, was there a marked shift in your kind of outlook, your religious outlook coming from the East, from, a, as you said, traditional Islamic background to the West, which is predominantly secular? 
Um, I think as a child, when I was seven, I don't, I don't remember much um, variation in religion. You know, I didn't notice that, okay, this country has a mosque and this country doesn't. Um, I remember as a, as a child going into school that it, uh, it was very different for me because I didn't speak the language. Um, also because I was a different colour to the other kids. Um, I remember that being a difference. Also, um, you know, the way uh, my parents would dress me was different to the way that other parents dressed their kids at the school that we went to. So outwardly there was a great difference that I noticed between me and everybody else. Um, but I, as a child from, you know, seven till about ten years old, there wasn't, um, th th there wasn't a great distinction I could have made uh, between Islam and non, you know, East and West, sure. the Islamic and the non-Islamic. Sure. When, when you say that term, your parents used to dress you differently, what, what exactly do you mean? Well, you know, I think coming from a, a different background, you know, you'd wear like velvet trousers and no other kids will wear velvet trousers. It's not, it's not you know, it's, it's nothing big, it's just different, different styles, different colours. Yeah, I, I think I can, I can relate to that because I spent some time back in my home country and came, to, came back to the UK where I was born and spent most of my life. Um, and I remember being picked on at school because I actually looked different. You know, the clothes that my parents were buying for me to go to school in made me stand out. Mm. I mean, was that a case for you? Yes, definitely, definitely. The thing is, I, I wouldn't blame them though. You know, of, course, it's, of course. It's not something that they, they understood. You know, I'm sure that they, from what they saw, they'd wish they were able to dress the same when they sure. were younger. So they had bought the best for me, but unfortunately it resulted in, um, uh, uh, in a divide between me and the children at school at that time. Obviously, as, uh, as you grow up, you learn, even if you're wearing different clothes, you learn to kind of blend in sure. uh, with the other children. Um, so, yeah, throughout my secondary school years, although um, I was still more or less an outcast for other reasons, um, you know, to some extent, I could still pass through the corridor without being picked on mm -hmm. for the way I dress or the way I looked. Why were you an outcast, if you don't mind me asking? Uh, no, not at all. Um, at secondary school, for reasons that I still don't understand fully, um, I, was, uh, I was picked on by you know, the popular kids, the English kids, who, um, who I think for, uh, who just didn't really, do, who didn't think deep into certain things, who didn't take their life seriously, who didn't take their education seriously. So coming from a background where my father is a doctor and my mother was a trained nurse and interpreter and assistant school teacher, you know, coming from such a, a deep uh, educational background, I was very motivated in my education. And I think that um, in comparison to the um, English residents here, or the ch their children, rather, who I was mixing with at school, um, maybe that, that, was, that was what caused them. Um, I'm guessing also I was, I think, one of three Asian kids in my year, so that could have been a reason. But I honestly, I don't understand it till now. So are you trying to say that you were <clears throat> very intelligent um, and took your, your studies seriously? I mean, were you, I don't mean this to be disrespectful, but when we were in school, we used to pick out students in the class and, you know, we would label them the, the teacher's pet. Oh, um, I, that's not disrespectful at all. I, I think I was definitely a teacher's pet. I was um, very excited about learning new things because I, I just was. I, I didn't understand the benefit of that, um, of that thirst for knowledge uh, then. But alhamdulillah, I'm very, very grateful for it. Um, it, was, it was something that I, it was very visible. You know, I remember even a teacher God forgive him, in a drama class had um, actually said that, you know, um, as part of drama they would, you know, try to give examples. They say, okay, so now imagine yourself as an animal, what would an animal be? You know, Latifa obviously likes to, she's always happy and she likes to please others, so she would be a dog. And um, <laughs> uh, so from, I think from a young age, people could notice that enthusiasm in me. And, uh, and it was something that I think other kids didn't like very much. Sure. What was it like um, in terms of the kind of ethos of the, the, the children that went to the school? I mean, were they well behaved? I mean, was there a drug problem? Were, you know, was this kind of the, the practice of boyfriend, girlfriends mm. quite rife in the school? 
Um, the school that I went to has um, actually recently been uh, attempted to shut down. As in, so you can imagine the uh, the behaviour that goes on, the low levels of uh, achievement that go on. So um, I think it would be fair to say that the school that I was in and the people that I was interacting with were of a really, very low humane nature. Um, they definitely girlfriend, boyfriend practices, you know, all, all that was happening from a very young age. Um, and the same can be said for drugs. You know, they were entered into schools. Children were smoking quite casually. Um, there was a lot of violence, I mm. remember, a lot of violence. Uh, you know, fights would happen every other day. We'd hear about girls and boys getting in trouble with drug dealers outside of uh, the school premises. Um, you know, gang on gang, you know, school on school type of violence. It was, it was um, very negative to think mm. back on it. Alhamdulillah, I didn't, ex I didn't feel that at the time. Uh, I was very unaware of... Uh, it felt like a distant uh, world to me. And I, and I don't associate that to Islam. Uh, it was just because it was, it, I was not with the crowd. That mm. was, I was completely outside of their inner circle. So it was a very dis distant lifestyle. For you. Okay, alhamdulillah. So at least um, that made life, I guess, a lot easier for you. Yeah, <coughs> with the benefit of hindsight, alhamdulillah. Um, were there other Muslims in the school? Um, there was, but I think there, there was no one that, I think because of the way I was, uh, which wasn't a, a practicing Muslim, you know, I hardly knew anything about my own religion. So in comparison to, to them who were probably existed, we, we, we had nothing in common for us to, to identify each other as Muslims and coming together and learning from each other and benefiting from each other's friendship. It was, um, so I, I wouldn't have known. Sure. So I guess... You hung around with those who were kind of like-minded in terms of their studies. Um, yes and no. I think through through my years of uh, secondary school, I was uh, I mixed around with a lot of different people. Alhamdulillah, I had you know my white nerdy friends. I had um, the you know the black thuggy thuggish type girls who would try and blackmail even me to into doing certain things. Um, and at the same time, I had my Muslim girls who take off their hijab for PE type people. So I had a, I had a, a, a very mixed variety of friends and a very mixed variety of influences. Sure. And um, back at home during these, um, these, the, in these years in your teens, um, I mean, was, was the situation still the same in terms of... So you wasn't really that influenced by religion at school or amongst your peers. And at home, was it the same? I mean, because I know you, you have quite a few brothers and mm -hmm. a sister as well. I mean, were any of them religious? Um, no, unfortunately, the, the background that I come from, and heavily dictated by my father, um, is very culturally based. It's, um, it's very, very shallow and, and has nothing really to do with religion. The only time I think religion comes into it is during Ramadan, during times of crisis, during uh, births, or during deaths, mm. um, you know, every... Marriages? Marriages, I actually, I wouldn't say so. Okay. Um, because of the types of weddings that, that would happen. Sure, sure. And also, <coughs> surprisingly, I've only learnt this recently, but um, the, you know, the certain laws that we have in uh, Shia Islam about mahar and, you know, the women choosing themselves um, or having access to the contract of marriage, you know, stipulating their own conditions that my aunties and my mother were not privileged to. So even within the marriage contract, there's, um, I, I don't see any real Islam in it. Mm. Yeah, that's quite an interesting point you've touched on there because, um, I mean, how was it in terms of you be, were you able to decipher the difference between religion and culture? Or did you assume it all to be culture, all to be religion, or just, uh, you know, both? I, um, I think up to secondary school, sixth form, so about 16, 17 years old, I had assumed that religion and culture were one. And especially because uh, we are Arabs, <laughs> unfortunately, I thought that, um, you know, 
that that was the way it was because you know the Quran came down in Arabic and then the Prophet was an Arab and the, therefore our culture was our religion and that we were smart enough to to use our religion and derive from it the good things and shape our culture around that. So I, that's what I had assumed. And had you assumed that based? I mean, was this a was this an assumption that you came to on your own, or do you think that's what everybody around you believed? Definitely what everybody around me believed and obviously because um, I think unfortunately families don't really pay much attention to the spiritual uh, development of an individual especially when they're in school and they're getting report cards every other month that they would push you more into the education side of things. Um, so I, I didn't really pay attention to that and I had assumed what I think it was an assumption of mine, but based on uh, the actions of my family and based on what you know, they would say, what they would do, how they would act. Mm, okay, interesting. Okay, so <clears throat> secondary school, alhamdulillah, as you said, you were able to keep out of the, you know, the, the goings-on that was uh, happening around you. So what happened after secondary school? Um, after secondary school, there was a great shift in my life. I had uh, moved from my mum's house and uh, moved to live with my father, um, who was very strict and very culturally based. You know, there was hardly any religion in the, in his actions or you know his treatment towards I think anyone in the family and outside. And um, so, to some extent, there was a. Uh, an implementation of modesty. So, you know, I had to, I couldn't wear short sleeves anymore, you know, I had to cover up up to my elbows. Uh, the, up you know, to your elbows? Yes, up to my elbows. And, um, you know, in some parts of the world, hijab is actually considered up to your elbows and up to your knees. Right. And this is unfortunately an Islamic thing. So, yes, uh, up to my elbows. Um, also, you know, clothing had to be up to a certain level, uh, you know, it had to extend and, and cover, you know, the legs and so whatnot. So, uh, it, I did feel a, a tighter, uh, a tighter implementation of, of what I thought was Islam on my life okay. at that time. What you thought was Islam. Yeah. Now, so you'd left the school that you were at previously, yes. where all of these goings on were, were taking place, and again, you know, there were some Muslims, but you know, you just kind of were friends with them, um, and then you moved to this new area which was Tutin, if I'm not yes, mistaken. Yes, Tutin. Now, what I know of Tutin is that it has a lot of Muslims living in, in that vicinity, in that particular area, and even further afield. Mm. So did this have any impact on your religion? Oh, alhamdulillah, <coughs> it, it did. Um, slow at first, but um, it speeded along later on. Um, when I, I had uh, enrolled in a sixth form, you know, next stage of education, so I interacted with a lot of people who were, you know, the same age as me, same colour as me, and the same religion as me. And, um, you know, at first uh, it, was, um, it was very basic, broad Islam, which I needed to learn because I, I had not known it before. Um, but then it, it, it got deeper, you know, people were uh, discussing things like shirk and bid'ah and um, mm -hmm. uh, that's where Shiism comes in, I guess. Of course, of course. But um, just, just uh, out of curiosity before we go for the break, because we're due for a break now, um, why, what sparked the interest at that particular juncture? Was it just simply because you were around Muslims and you just wanted to find out more about the religion or, or what? No, it was... Um, SubhanAllah, looking back on it, you think the way God makes uh, plans for us, you know, you could never program it yourself. Um, the way it happened was uh, just a random friend had asked me, you know, what, what do you think of the Shia? And talking out of ignorance and, and, you know, coming from a very cultured background, the first thing that came out of my mouth was, they are kafir, they, uh, they beat themselves up, it's haram, it's un-Islamic, they're not Muslims, and that's the end of that. Um, and my friend, uh, who, was, who was Shia, a uh, very close friend of mine, alhamdulillah, till this day, uh, was, was listening to this and she was very, very shocked by what I had said and very upset, understandably. Um, it's only when I realised what I had said and who I had said it to that uh, we had a conversation and she just told me that, look, you know, you don't even know what you're saying. If um, Her reaction just, you know, woke me up and... I had thought, if uh, this, this is a close friend of mine, I know her character, she's a good person. 
a good person cannot cannot follow something so wrong as to be called a, mush, uh, a mushrik or a kafir. Mm. So because of my friend and what she had believed in and the way that I felt I had hurt her and my own ignorance, I felt that it was wajib on me to, to learn more about her situation and her religion. Okay, brilliant. Thank you very much. Sister Latifa, uh, we're due for a break now, as I said. Inshallah, when we come back, you can let us know how your uh, quest for knowledge about the madhab of Ahlul Bayt uh, progressed, inshallah. Join us after this short break. See you soon. Assalamu alaikum. <laughs>